um, so like I was saying earlier, it's, it's um, I'm always encouraged to read the testimonies of, or hear the testimonies of you all. Um, it really blesses my heart. One of the prayers we have prayed for many years that I prayed and I heard my uh, the el elders in Bangalore praying um, is that if there's anyone that is really hungering for a godly life, that God would bring us in touch with them. Not because we are special or that we're better or anything like that. If anything, most of us feel like we're worse, that we're less deserving of God's mercy, less deserving that God would show us his truth. But simply that we are really, really keen that Jesus Christ would get all the glory from our lives. I'm not interested in living a life where I get to enjoy my life on this earth and then enjoy life in heaven. I want to give my life so fully, more fully today to Jesus and more fully tomorrow to Jesus and deny myself, take up my cross. And I believe that will be true joy, much greater than me picking a comfortable life for myself or something that will, some success here on this earth. And because I'm after that, if there's somebody else that's also after that, because it's rare to find such people in this world, even in Christendom. Uh, and a little bit of my testimony, I don't want to make this what I share about myself, but when I left India at the age of 18, um, at that point, I, all I had listened to was CFC teachings and mostly Brother Zach. And so when I came to the U.S., um, all, I wanted to listen to anybody except Brother Zach. Because I, I knew what he said. And, um, you know, I was young, 18-year-old, brash, teenager, thinking, uh, I'm sure there's other good stuff out there. And I, I was around other Christians who listened to a lot of these hip preachers who dressed cool, had cool hairstyles. And, um, you know, I, I, back then they didn't have Instagram or anything, those things. But they were hip and very cool and um, attractive to the world and attractive in the church. And I thought, well, that, yeah, that, that's a good, good thing to have, right? And, um, and even others who I allowed myself to listen to. And I found after some time that there was a slow decaying that, go, that was going on inside. Now, I want to be absolutely clear that that decaying had nothing to do with the preachers. Any spiritual backsliding has only to do with ourselves. I can't blame anybody else if I'm not growing spiritually because God has given to us his word. He's given to us his Holy Spirit. When Jesus sat in those synagogues listening to the hypocritical, uh, proud Pharisees preaching, he was in the presence of the Father. The Holy, he was full of the Holy Spirit there. And he is my example. And if Jesus could be all by himself, not a single person, his entire life was there to uh, encourage him. Maybe for the last three and a half years, he was around those 12 disciples and they brought him some encouragement, but usually he was having to encourage them. And I'm not saying, I'm not here to discount fellowship. I, I'm a part of a local church and I'm very thankful for that. But in order for us to really be a useful member in a local church. We must first have come to the place where I don't need the church. I need Jesus. And there's a lot of people that are looking for churches because they want friendship. They want other people that, that they can be around. They want activities. They want prayer meetings. They want Bible studies. They want games that they can play. They want places where their children can have friends. Uh, and a nice, cozy atmosphere in which you can uh, be a Christian in a church. And those are just clubs. And I wrote about that in that book that you mentioned, Brother Baba Tope. Um, and I've seen that, that that club mentality is all over the place. And I would say it's becoming increasingly more clear to me that in order for me to be truly effective in the church, I must learn to walk alone with Jesus. And learn the joy of that. Have come to the place where Jesus alone is enough for me. 
If I need Jesus plus something else, and um, if I need Jesus plus, let's let's start with maybe what we would all call carnal. If I need if I need Jesus plus money, I think all of us would say, you should. You're not really a Christian because Jesus said you can't love God and money. Well, if I said if you need Jesus plus a wife, if you're a single brother or a husband, if you're a single sister, then you need Jesus plus something. I think all of us would say, no, Jesus is enough. Or if I need Jesus plus a good job or Jesus plus a nice house, Jesus plus a car to drive. I think theoretically we would all agree, no, that's not right. Jesus is enough. But what about Jesus plus I need a local church? I need some place that I can go to, some friends that I can have here on this earth. That is a Jesus plus something mindset that will lead us to building a club. And um, so what I saw when I came here to this country was um, uh, a lot of clubs, a lot of religious clubs, Christian clubs that were doing a lot of good things. And uh, I was part of a church in California that grew from, I think when I started going there, it may have been three, 400 people. By the time I left there, left California 11 years later, um, it was, I think, over 10,000 people. And it wasn't a mega church in the way that you think of most mega churches, because they had some good teaching and did some wonderful ministry among homeless people and drug addicts, alcoholics, um, prison ministries, and a lot of those things. And I started to try to find my identity and my being a Christian in those activities that I did. And uh, meanwhile, what was happening as I was being influenced by a lot of these other preachers was that inside there was a decay. And I believe, I've come to see that anytime Jesus alone is not enough for me. Anytime Jesus alone is not enough for me, I am going to decay spiritually. And I think that applies to all of us. Here I am in Loveland, Colorado, part of a wonderful church that I'm so thankful for. I would be so happy just to spend the rest of my years here, if God wills, in this church. And not only that, I'm called to be one of the leaders in this church. And yet I know that at this very moment, if that church that I'm a part of or the ministry that God has given me in this church becomes something that I'm attached to beyond Jesus himself, I've already started to decay spiritually. And then I could sit, and that's perhaps a, a greater danger, is that I could sit in a like-minded CFC-affiliated church, dead spiritually. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 3. We read about a church here that I believe fell into this very trap. Revelation chapter 3. It says, To the angel of the church in Sardis, Revelation 3, verse 1, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this. Now, it's interesting that he uses this picture of the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. If you read Revelation chapter 1, you see that Jesus is walking among these seven stars. He's got these stars in his hand. So here was a church that Jesus himself was saying, I'm, I'm upholding this church, the church in Sardis. I know your deeds. Now, I want to skip down a, a few verses. There were people in this church in verse 4, Revelation 3, verse 4. A, there were people in Sardis who had not soiled their garments. And they were walking, they will walk with me in white, he says, for they are worthy. And, um, but look at what was the condition of most of the church. I know your deeds, verse 1 that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. So to me, what that means is this was a church that everybody around that area was talking about. Man, Church of Sardis, they're on fire for the Lord. They're alive. That's a living church. And maybe other people would, maybe even some of the apostles. I mean, I, back then, all of these churches were planted by the apostles or 
uh, somebody under the apostles directly. This is first generation Christianity. Within the first, this is written in 90 AD, 60 years after, 50 years after, 50, 60 years after Jesus uh, rose and after the day of Pentecost, John is still alive. We're living, this is a church at a time when people who actually saw Jesus physically were still alive. And already we have a church that around them, everybody thinks this is a living church. And that could apply to any one of us. And I, I really believe that could apply to me that any one of you or others could say, wow, Brother Santosh, I'm so blessed by his life. And he's, a, he's on fire for the Lord. And, you know, you know, you all have thanked me and thanked my dad and all that. But I recognize that if Jesus alone is not enough for me, then inwardly will start this decay where outwardly I can continue. I can continue to look as a good member of the church, a good brother in the church, a good husband, a good father, and even a good elder and a good preacher. What do you think was going on in the meetings in Sardis? I think there was wonderful preaching going on. And I, I mean, if it was boring preaching and a dead church, everybody would say it was a dead church. This was a church if you went there, and unless you were discerning like the apostle John, or unless you had, you know, could see things from heaven's perspective, I'm quite sure if I had gone to a meeting in Sardis, I would have thought, this is a great church. I want to be a part of this church. And yet they were dead. And so he says, wake up, strengthen the things that remain, which are about to die. I mean, they were so bad spiritually that they were about to die. And the meetings were continuing. So um, why, why do I say that if, if it's Jesus plus something else, then um, a DK will begin? See, when, when we say that we, we want Jesus, he is the tree of life. You know, in the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. You read about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And the tree of life is Jesus himself alone. It's fellowship with him. It's knowing Jesus. And uh, bec uh, because you read that, right? You know this verse in John chapter 17. I hope you know it. Let's look at it. John 17, verse 3, it says, this is eternal life. Or you could say, this is what it means to eat out of the tree of life. You know, in, in the end of Genesis chapter 3, God says that um, they uh, he has to protect the Adam and Eve from the tree of life. Let, keep a finger in, in John 17. I'll come back to it and turn over quickly to Genesis chapter 3. At the end of the fall, after Adam and Eve had eaten out of the tree and God curses the ground, God curses the serpent. And uh, then he says, uh, you know, he clothes them. And, uh, you know, there's a curse <laughs> on the world now because of sin. But then look at verse 22 at the end of it before, um, uh, just before he chases the man the Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. He it says he puts a uh, cherubim, verse twenty four, to guard the tree of life. And he says, why did God forbid or guard the tree of life? You read that in verse twenty two. The Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat. And live forever. And what God was protecting them from, and what was um, what you see there is this first picture of eternal life. And God had intended for Adam and Eve to eat out of the tree of life. That means that dependence on God. Now turn back to John chapter 17. We see what eternal life really means. What did God intend for Adam and Eve? to do and to how did he intend for them to live was by eating out of the tree of life and as long as they ate out of the tree of life they would live forever they they would never have died because jesus god said in the day that you eat out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you will die and so they were going to live forever and that tree of life is a picture of dependence on god dependence on god alone 
so we read here in John 17, verse 3, that this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So what I see when I put these two together is that eating out of the tree of life, that is knowing Jesus and knowing the Father and knowing Jesus, knowing them intimate, intimately. And by knowing, um, it's this knowing that involves a dependence on. It's the same word that, again, I'd like you to go back to Genesis chapter 4. In the very next chapter, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, you read this word, know. And it's, pict it's picturing the relationship between a man and a woman that results in them being able to conceive um, a child. And it says, the man knew his wife Eve. That's the literal word used there. The man knew his wife Eve. And why is that word know used there? And again, in John chapter 17, because that knowing is an implies that without that togetherness, no fruit can ever happen. When, and so when it says that Adam knew his wife, there was a dependence that Adam was expressing with Eve and Eve was expressing with Adam that says, Unless we come together, unless we are dependent on each other this way, no life can come out of us. And if Adam hadn't known his wife, they would have remained barren. There would have been no offspring. And it's the same spiritually for us today as well. That unless we know Christ that way, unless we know Christ and are dependent on him and him alone, all our meetings, all our efforts to have, uh, raise a godly home and raise our children and train them the right way and send them to the right schools and have a good meeting and have a good church and listen to the right teachings. All of that will be just eating out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so eating out of the tree of life is depending on Jesus and him alone. Uh, my testimony after that was after things continued to decay because I was um, talking about Jesus, telling others about Jesus, going in wherever I could, prisons, uh, uh, recovery homes, homeless shelters, I would preach Jesus. and But I didn't, I, Jesus wasn't a, enough for me. And my honest testimony is that the result of that was such deep spiritual decay inside. Finally came to the place where I said, Lord, I need help. Where, where, what should I do? And this was around the year 2000 or so, so 23 years ago. And the Lord showed me that a, a couple of things that I want to, close with and that is that uh, the importance of being under spiritual authority there's a verse in hebrews chapter 13 this is very important for us to know because if you're looking for a church or looking to be a part of a church or to build a church if there isn't one in your area to allow the lord to build one through you because you want friends or you want connections or you want other people that believe the same thing, one day that will fade away. And I'm saying this only to save you wasted time because I've, I've seen so many people who seemed so on fire, so gripped by the truth in Bangalore and in other parts of this country as well, who over time, it, <coughs> excuse me, faded away. They, there was something else that they wanted. And if Jesus is not enough for you in himself, the time will come if it's a true living church. Please listen carefully. If Jesus is not enough for you by himself, the time will come if you are part of a good living church that you will get offended. Because a good living church is one for whom Jesus is enough. That's all they want. They only want Jesus. And you will find that you're around other people who only want Jesus. And sometimes they're that's all they're interested in. And their fellowship comes from desiring jesus alone not friends and connections and activities and bible studies and prayer meetings and so rather than start out down that path let's start if you, you know we, there isn't a local fellowship there in michigan a lo local church as such established uh yet but if god was to establish one and i hope he does and i thank god for what he's doing in chicago as well for you there as you are in these uh, early stages of the church as it were check yourselves brothers and, and for me as well i check myself to see that we're 
building a church along the right path. And that is that Jesus alone is enough for us. And uh, the verse in Hebrews 13 was verse 17, where I realized that what I needed was to be under spiritual authority, that I didn't have older brothers, elders who over, could oversee my life. And this verse, the Lord spoke to me through this verse, Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders and submit to them for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. And that word unprofitable came alive for me one day when I was reading it. And it's like the Lord was telling me, Santosh, do you see why there's a lack of profit growth in your life spiritually? Unprofitable means decay. It's the same thing. Profitable means growth. Unprofitable means decay. You see why there's backsliding decay, a lack of profit. You're going backwards spiritually. Outwardly, you have a name. I mean, I could go to those homeless shelters and they love to listen to me. I had great stories to tell and all, I could talk about Jesus, but inwardly I was decaying. And I realized that I needed spiritual authority over me. And so I went looking for, for a church because I needed to be under spiritual authority. I wanted to submit. I wanted to go under. I wanted to go lower. And so in, in, this, in this conversation I was having with the Lord, the Lord asked me, Santosh, who are your leaders who you submit to? And in my conversation with the Lord, I said, it's my dad. And the Lord very flat, flatly said, no, <laughs> he's in India. You're here in the, in the US. He, has, he doesn't know how you're living your life. You're not submitted to him in a way that he can give account for how you're living your life. And I said, okay, Lord, where are they? I want to go and submit to such elders who will love me enough to speak the truth to me, not just to keep me in their church or make me happy by saying nice things to me, but people who have my eternal destiny, people who see themselves as giving an account for me to God, not just happy that their church is so big or whatever. They recognize that I have to give an account to God for this soul. I better know how he's doing or how she's doing. And after a few years of looking, I thought, well, such a church doesn't exist in America because there were no like-minded churches affiliated with CFC back then. And I was prepared to move back to India. Many of us, I think all of you who are of Indian origin, have worked hard and maybe Nigerian origin too, have worked hard to come to this country. You had to pass some tests, you had to write exams, and it was very stressful. You had to wait a long time. You had to get a visa. And I went through it, played all of that back in my mind, waiting in line at the visa office, fear of getting rejection. The, the trembling with which I stood in front of the consulate officer, knowing that if he said denied, it was it. I couldn't argue. We've all been there, right? We worked hard. And uh, I realized that living in this country was an idol for me. That I wanted a life here that I might not have if I went back to India. And the time came where the Lord broke that, where it became nothing for me. See, I wanted Jesus plus, oh, let me have Jesus and living in America. Jesus plus a ministry. And the Lord had to bring me to the place where Jesus was all I wanted. I said, Lord, I'll go back to India. I, I, I mean, going back to India, I, you know, I'd probably make it sound like it's such a horrible thing. I think I would love to live in India right now, honestly. But back then, it was, I didn't want to. And um, it was an idol. It was like an Isaac that the Lord had to see me lay on the altar. I said, Lord, I am desperate. Where I live on this earth and what I do for a, for a job and how much money I have or it means nothing. What will it matter in heaven if I gain the whole world, but I've lost my soul because I chased after some earthly dream? And I laid it on the altar. And, you know, I, obviously I'm not in India. The Lord, having seen that broken in me, showed me that he had a plan for me to be in this country. And I look at now how the Lord has brought fellowship to me and brought me into fellowship with many brothers and sisters in Colorado and around the world, like you all, around the country, like you all. But what I'm getting at, brothers, my testimony is different from all of yours, I'm sure of that. But what I'm getting at is that God is looking for those, first of all, for whom he is enough. They, they Really ask yourself. I'll tell you honestly, if you had asked me in 1999 if Jesus was enough for me, intellectually, I would have said yes. Intellectually, I would have said yes. 
But as God, I allowed God to start to dig a little bit and peel off the layers a little bit, I realized there was Jesus plus something else. And then when that layer got peeled off, there was Jesus plus some other thing that was buried a little bit deeper. And then we peel that off and there was Jesus plus some other thing. And I believe that the journey of Christian sanctification, sanctification is a big word, is becoming more like Christ. That's what sanctification is essentially. But the journey of sanctification, the journey of becoming more like Christ essentially is this, that I peel off all the layers where I see that I'm wanting something else beside Jesus himself. And the end of it all, if you turn over to 1 John chapter 3, This is my favorite verse in the entire Bible. It might change, but right now this is it. It's been that for some years. And maybe I can make it your favorite verse as well, but I want to tell you why. Well, first John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold. So the King James says, New American says, see. I like the word behold better. Behold. I mean it's a little bit more than just see. Stop, sit down, think about it for a little while. Behold, think deeply on it, meditate. How great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called the children of God, and such we are. Yes, we are children of God. And then he goes on to say, For this reason, the world does not know us. Beloved, now we are children of God, and yet we don't look like children of God. You see what he says? Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. So there's two aspects of being a child of God. One is that I am adopted into God's family. And I think of myself as being adopted into God's family, the father's family. My older brother is Jesus. But... Um, you know, I, I don't know if we have any adopted children here, and, uh, but if you've seen adopted children, you can tell they look a little bit different. They're, you can tell, oh, that's adopted. And we would never make them feel less for that, but you know, they look different because they're not biological. It's not that seed. And they're adopted. So here I was when I first came into God's family, adopted, very much a part of the family, but I look like me <laughs> still. And God then started a work of transformation in me so that little by little I'm starting to look like my older brother Jesus that is his intent and that's what he says that's that second part of being a child of God is now it, it won't be just that God took me ugly and filthy as I was and cleaned me up and brought me into his family and then there's Jesus and then there's this adopted brother Santos who looks nothing like Jesus it started there but thank God that through his Holy Spirit, he's doing a work because he doesn't want in eternity Jesus and then a whole bunch of other adopted children that look nothing like him. It's one family. And the second aspect of being a child of God is that I look like my older brother. And, you know, I have six children. If you look at any of my children and look at the others, you'll say, yeah, they're all related. See, there's six children. They're all, they must all be Santosh and Megan's children. They look like each other. And this gripped my heart that God would love me so much, not only that he would behold what great a love, he says. That God would love me so much, not only to include me in his family, that is a wonderful thing in itself. But that he would say, Santosh, I want you to look as if you've always been a part of my family. To look as righteous as Jesus looked, has looked all along. What a wonderful thing. This filthy wretch full of pride and selfishness and self-seeking and lust and anger that you picked up from the pit and all the areas of self-seeking that you've shown me over the years even as a christian that you would really make me look as if i was all along as righteous as jesus was this is the beauty of what heaven will be like christ will have imparted his righteousness to me to you if you have the faith that you will look as if you've been righteous all along. And that ought, you, ought to cause you, cause me, cause us to fall on my face and say, Lord, why would you love me so much? I don't deserve this. I remember so well the pit that you picked me up from. I remember so much that what it took for you to purify me from my filth. 
that you had to suffer on the cross and be abandoned by your father, forsaken by your father, all so that not just that I go to heaven, but that I go to heaven and I look like Jesus because it says, we are children of God. It has not appeared as yet what we will be, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Oh, I hope you believe this. I do. And at times when I fall, which I still do sometimes, I don't walk in the darkness, but I stumble. Sometimes I fall. Maybe I speak a rude word or have a proud thought and I humble myself. I'll tell you what picks me up. It used to, I'll tell you what used to pick me up was that I was afraid of going to hell. That if I remained in that pit of sin, I might die in my sin. I thank God that I'm freed from that. I know I'm, I'm not afraid of going to hell. I'll tell you what's a greater fear in my life. That I'll stand there in heaven looking like an adopted child. It looks nothing like Jesus. I think that there will be such people in heaven. You read in the book of Revelation, especially chapter 14, of a great multitude. And then you read about the bride of Christ that has followed him wherever he went and has been fully conformed into his image. That's what I want to be a part of. And I, I know it will be a joy to be in heaven, but I, I don't want to be there as an invitee to the wedding. And I, I, I'll leave you with this thought, my dear brothers and sisters. Take a look at the invitation that Jesus has given you. If you read this Bible carefully, it says very carefully, he's invited you to be standing at the altar with him at the wedding feast in heaven. There's going to be a wedding feast in heaven. And Jesus wants you sitting next to him as his bride. Not the guest who's invited to watch Jesus and his bride. And that's the essential difference between what's been preached in a lot of Christendom and what I, is being preached in the true New Covenant churches. I won't say only CFC churches because I don't believe that's true. And I don't know if necessarily all CFC churches are preaching that either or living it out. I don't know. God is the judge of that. But look to be a part of a church that points you to your destination, which is to be sitting at the table with Jesus at the marriage feast, not just watching the wedding, the wedding feast. And if you want to be there, follow him wherever he goes. This is the lamb that followed him wherever he went. That means my only goal in life is to follow Jesus, not to go to here to be a part of that church. If, if Jesus told me, I'm Santosh, your walk with me is going to take you to somewhere in the middle of, let's say, Arkansas. I say, Lord, I'm going there. But there's no church there. Okay. But Jesus, you're there. Then that's where I want to be. And I'm here at RLCF in Loveland because Jesus is walking with me here. And he's called me to walk with him in this church. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful life. And that involves sacrifice, involves denying ourselves, seeking no reputation, seeking no ministry, and um, but seeking only Jesus.